So 53 BC to 633, almost seven centuries, the Persians and the Romans fight it out. Brutal, nasty, knock down, drag out fights. But in the middle of all of this, there's one thing that's really powerful and important for our purposes, and it's the great library. One of the Greeks who went with Alexander and conquered the Persians, his name was Ptolemaeus. Ptolemy the first, Sotir. Ptolemy the savior. That's the title he took. He goes and carves Egypt out of this Greek empire when Alexander the Great dies. And then he founds the Great Library. The idea behind the Great Library is it'll be the world's repository for information. And what they're going to do is they're going to bring books from every society and every culture there and keep a copy. And they're going to invent things. The idea was that you could go to Alexandria, visit the library, see the museum, see the advanced tech, and then build on it. But then once you built on it, you were supposed to bring your advances there so that the next generation of advances could be made based, based on yours. At its height, the Great Library may have reached as many as a million books, but they run out of time. They run out of time because Rome converts to Christianity. As Rome switched to being Christian and dumped its pagan roots, it also started to slowly move away from this idea that it needed to be advanced technologically. And in 391 AD, it took that to the maximum level when Emperor Theodosius issued a decree declaring that the Roman Empire was not, it wasn't just that Christianity was the official religion, it wasn't just that Christianity was the state's religion, it was also the only religion. Non-Christians were no longer welcome in the empire. Jews and pagans needed to convert or leave. And when that happened, the Archbishop of Alexandria, Archbishop Theophilus, issued his own decree asking the Christian population of Alexandria to, to go ahead and get rid of the pagans and the Jews. They went to the Jewish quarter. Alexandria was the largest Jewish city on the planet. The mob goes to the Jewish quarter and just begins massacring the Jews. They then go to the Great Library. The Great Library was run by a woman named Hypatia. Hypatia was, wasn't actually technically a pagan. She was, she was a theist, so she did believe that there was an entity that created the universe, a single entity, but she didn't think that anybody could know its nature, so she rejected Christianity. And, but the majority of the students at the Great Library and the majority of the professors at the Great Library were, in fact, pagan. And so the mob decides to get rid of the Great Library and they destroy it. But we, as a society, get lucky because before they destroyed it by a few decades, there was a Persian emperor who got jealous of the Great Library. His name was Shapur, Shapur the Great. Shapur wanted his own great library. He defeats a Roman emperor, Valerian. He captures two intact Roman legions. He sells one into slavery in China, takes the money from the sale, and then he uses that money and orders the Roman legions to build him two brand new cities. One of them is Gondi Shapur. In Gondi Shapur, he builds an academy that will be the Persian equivalent to the great library. And he starts collecting books. He's having trouble getting Roman books because the Romans and the Persians hate each other so much, but he has ha he's having no trouble getting Chinese texts and Indian texts. And so he's adding those to the Persian knowledge. Lao Tzu, he gets Lao Tzu, one of the greatest philosophers in human history. It, it, not, not him, but his books, right? It, Lao Tzu is 600 years earlier. But he gets his books, which is amazing because when Qin the Great unifies India, he bans Lao Tzu and starts wiping out Lao, Lao Tzu's works, but now there's a place for them to survive. When the Great Library is burnt, a group of Romans decide to recover, and they do it at the Academy, the Academy of Athens. But Emperor Justinian goes, nah, we got rid of the Great Library, we don't need an Academy to replace it. Those Greek scholars in 529, when the Academy is banned, grab all their books, they jump on a ship, they head to Syria, they cross Syria, they get to what would roughly be the Iraq-Syria border today. It was roughly where the Roman 
Persian border was. And they, they, they approach the Persians and they say, we want asylum. And the Persians go, yeah, of course. Who would want to live under Roman rule anyway? These guys are crazy. And they go, well, yeah, not for us only. We want asylum for our books. And the Persians go, your books? And they go, yeah, we're, we're bringing everything we have left that hasn't been burnt by Christian mobs. And the Persians go, oh, come with us. And they take them to Gondi Shapur and they take all those books and they merge them in. Emperor Khusro is the guy who does this. So now at, the, at, the, at Gondi Shapur, they have all these Roman and Greek and Egyptian works and they're sitting there with all these Chinese and Persian and Indian works. And they kind of recovered the loss of the great library a little bit. Rome and Persia keep fighting. They do one giant slugfest in the early 600s. And then something amazing happens. There's a new religion. And it's Islam. The Prophet Muhammad dies in 632. The Caliph, his follower, the first ruler after the Prophet, launches two armies at the same time simultaneously. One into the Persian Empire, one into the Roman Empire. Outnumbered, outmanned, out-technologied. There's no way the Arabs should prevail. Within a few decades, they completely conquer the Persian Empire. It was 1,200 years old at that point. They bring the Romans to their knees. They don't finish them off. But by the time they're done, they owned everything from Pakistan to Spain and Central Asia. They built the largest empire in human history in just a few decades. 60% of the world's Christian population. The empire itself was 2% Muslim. It was an empire of Buddhists and Hindus. There were even some pagans hanging around. And Zoroastrians. The Arabs were a strange conqueror population these Arabs were actually shot or humble. So when they conquered Persia, they went to the Persians and they went, dude, we don't know how to run an empire. <laughs> this is way over our pay grade. We, we've never, we just started ruling ourselves. We, we don't know what we're doing here. You guys are amazing at this. What we need you to do is keep running the empire. We don't even know how to mint coins. Those Arabs walked into Gondi Shapur after conquering it. And they turned to the Persians and they went, what's that? And the Persians go, it's an academy. The Arabs go, cool, what is that? They go, it's a repository of all the knowledge of the world that we, that we know of. And the Arabs go, show us. And the Persians go, what choice do we have? Take them in. And the Arabs go, teach us. And the Persians go, what choice do we have? We will. It takes a while, it doesn't happen right away. But in the 8th century, Al-Kindi begins converting these texts from Greek to Arabic. And that's a huge leap because now it means a larger portion of the population can start to read them.